The fall brings death, and blood sacrifices brought temporary life for just a little bit. However, in this passage, and what we're reading right here in verse 7a says, in Ephesians 1, In Him, Jesus Christ, we Christians have redemption through His blood, Jesus' lifeblood. Welcome to Unleashing the Truth where the power of God's Word is unleashed into your life. Here is Pastor John Jordan with today's message. In Christ, we've been talking about, we who are in Him are rich. In Christ, we've been made worthy, that's blessed by Him. And that means all of your past debts, all the sins from your all the skeletons in your closet in the past, all the way to their present liabilities, they're covered by the blood of Christ. They they are healed. And even the future needs are reserved in heaven. In Christ, we are rich. All of us are in Christ, are rich in three parts of our life, three areas, three epics, the past and the present and the future. Two weeks ago, we took kind of a a deep dive just in the greeting, just in opening remarks of the letter that Paul wrote, verse 1 and 2 of Ephesians. And we looked at the fact that Paul was blessed. Paul was a man made worthy because, not of his own power, because not of his own pedigree, because Paul used to be Saul, and he was an enemy of Christ, he was a God-hater, he was a church destroyer, and God sovereignly reached into Saul's life, pulled him to himself, and made him worthy. Made him an apostle. So in Christ, all Paul's past sins as Saul were forgiven, wiped clean, which is justification, which is salvation. And in Christ, Paul's present liabilities were forgiven. Even though Romans 7 says, I keep doing the things I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. And that's called his sanctification process. In Paul's future, his glorification in heaven was secured When he physically died, he went straight in the presence of Christ in heaven, justified. And the fact is, his position in Christ was made a reality when he stood before Christ. And not only Paul, we understand that the entire church, all believers, all saints, holy ones, are set apart and consecrated, and God declared them just. And all of you who accepted Christ are declared righteous from all your past sins in Christ. We're forgiven of everything, all of our debt. And we walk in the faith in the present battle of sanctification. And we were just talking about this this morning in Sunday school. We battle and we battle to become the express image of Christ in our life. And we keep fighting with our old nature, our old man, and we still sin. And we're trying to get the mind of Christ put in us, Romans 12, 2. But we also are blessed because our future is set. We are going to be glorified in heaven forever. And we don't know what that's going to look like, but we know we're going to be like what Jesus looked like when he walked in his resurrected body. So therefore, it's not just Paul. It's not just those believers in Ephesus. It's every one of us here today. We are disciples of Jesus. We are Christ's followers. And we are rich in him in every area that matters. In our past, in our present, and in the future. We have salvation. We're going through sanctification. And we're going to have glorification. That's why in verse 3 it says, Blessed be the Father. Because He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Everything that matters in heavenly places in Christ has been given to us. We are rich. Your bank account may have a big fat zero in it, but you're rich. Your past, your present, your future is secure. You're made worthy in Christ. And now you need to walk worthy. That's what Ephesians 4, 1 is going to tell us when we get there in a couple years. Walk in a manner that it's worthy of the calling which you've been called. Ephesians 4, 1. You're made worthy, chapters 1 through 3. Then you walk worthy, chapters 4 through 6. Also, we understand that the entire Godhead is involved in this. It's not just Jesus. It's not just the Father. It's not just the Spirit. The salvific plan of God comes in all these ways. Ephesians is going to take us there in, in, in the fullness of God's place in us. That's the Father, chapter 3, verse 19. The fullness of Christ, that's chapter 4, verse 13. That's the Son. The fullness of the Spirit, that's chapter 5, verse 18. That is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That's the Trinity. 
So in Christ, and in the Father, and in the Spirit, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing because of Christ coming from heaven down to you and I. And we looked at last week, the very first spiritual blessing, the very most important spiritual blessing from Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, is the weighty doctrine of election. And we went through that in great detail. And if you missed that, you can go on to our website and listen to last week's discussion on election. And for some people, that's a scary word. For some people, that's a dirty word. But election is by the Father. It's a gift from heaven to us, making us holy. Because we're not holy on our own. And we saw that He chose us. He predestined us. He adopted us in Christ. And I just say, forget saying, why not something in your mind? And start saying, why would God choose to adopt or predestine you? That's what you could ask. Because that's a gift that God gave to you if you're saved. In eternity past, before the foundation of the world, pre-Genesis 1.1, God didn't make anything yet, and God wrote some names down on a list in a book. And those names are those he would choose, those he would predestine, those he would draw, those he would call, those he would rescue, those he would save. And so in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5 says, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments in heaven, covered in white. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. But, Jesus says, I will confess that name, your name, before the Father and before the angels in heaven. And I say, what a blessing. You're going to have your name read on the roll call in heaven. And we spent a good amount of time in Acts showing how Paul, who used to be Saul, who wrote the letter to the Ephesians, was not seeking Jesus. He was not looking for Jesus to get saved by Jesus. He was looking for him to destroy the church, to destroy any remnant of Jesus, but he wasn't looking to be saved by Jesus. He wasn't a seeker. And Romans 10 verse 20 says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Paul's not seeking him. Paul's not asking for him. And Paul's an example of us. We did not seek him either. We did not. We hated God. We hated Christ. We're at war with God, pre-salvation. We all were at that point. And the truth is, some of us still here today are still at war with God. Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, not even one. How many is none? There is none, verse 11, who understands. There is none who seeks for God. And that's why I said we're not going to create seeker-sensitive services because there's no such thing as a seeker. If Paul's not a glaring enough example, though I said, think of your own life, pre-conversion. He did not come and say, would you like to accept me? And you said, that's a pretty good idea. I'm going to accept you, Lord. No, you didn't choose him. You didn't seek him. You weren't drawing near to him. You didn't know him. You didn't love him first. He loved you. He drew you. He chose you. And I said, it's like that car you buy that's a certain color. And you say, I've never seen this car in this color before. And then when you get it home, you realize there's three of them on the block that you live that have been there, but you never saw it before. When you see election in the scriptures, you'll see it everywhere. Because God is God, and there's no other way. Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless something happens first. The Father in heaven who sent me down here draws that person to me, then I will raise him up on the last day. I will save him. Jesus said in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. And I reminded all of us, I'll remind you today to say, forget saying, why did not God choose everyone? And start saying, why did he choose anyone? Why would God plan to kill his son on the cross for an enemy? That's what you should ask yourself. Why would he do that? And the answer, as we saw last week, is at the end of verse 4. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him, period, in the English, in love. Why did God do this? He loved. God is love. And God loved those who are not lovable. That's you and me. And He chose us and He sacrificed the beloved, His Son, to purchase us for salvation. How blessed are we in Christ then? 
And that's why I said you can't be an Eeyore Christian walking around because you watch the news and you see what's happening in Israel and you let your whole demeanor be crushed because we have everything in Christ. How unbelievably rich are we in Christ? He predestined us. He adopted us. Who's in charge of the adoption process? The adoptee or the adopter? Why would he do it? It says the kind of intention of his will. So he gets all the glory. He gets all the praise. God loved us. God adopted us. God chose us according to his will. So ultimately, he gets the glory. If it's none of you and all of him, he gets all the glory. And so I I say that to, to, to set us up for today. Why would God do this? Why would God choose to adopt a little orphan, John Jordan? Why? Why would he sacrifice, a great sacrifice, to choose to adopt me or you? Why would he choose to love us? Because he's kind. Because he loved you. Because he gets all the glory. He showed you grace, which is undeserved favor. That's why it says, blessed be God for this. So it's clear that the first and the greatest, and I had to recap it with some fervor, with some passion, with some heat, with some weight, because this spiritual blessing of election is huge. It's foundational. It's your justification. It is your salvation. It's the predetermined will of God in heaven reaching down and saying, I'm deciding way back before I did anything to put this blessing on you, your election. So that's number one in your outlines from last week, which takes us to number two. The second major doctoral blessing towards his own children from God is the blessing of redemption in the Son. Number one was the blessing of election by the Father in the past. And number two is the blessing of redemption in the Son, which is the present. Verse 6b through 12. And I realize there's no B in your Bible, but it means halfway through. Let me reread this portion. Verse 6b says, Which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, things on earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Do you see it over and over and over? His will, his deciding, his doing it. Verse 12, to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be the promise, would be the praise, sorry, of his glory. We have spiritual blessing. We know we've been elected. We know we got saved. And that blessing, it says, is freely bestowed on us. In the original language, it says, you've been graced by grace. You've been graced by grace. If you're a Christian here today, if you're a Christ follower here today, you've been graced by God by showing you grace, undeserved favor. And how does a God who's holy and perfect show sinners grace? And how could he grace you with grace? Well, the answer is in the next phrase, in the beloved. In your Bibles, look at your Bibles, there's a capital B, in the beloved. You know who that beloved is? That's Jesus Christ. You can read it. He is freely the Father bestowed on us in the Son, in Christ, in Jesus, in the beloved. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus said, Behold... The Father said, rather, Behold, a voice came out of the heavens and said, This is my what son? Beloved son. Beloved is Jesus. He's the beloved of the Father. Colossians 1.13 For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So all those who are in Christ, if you're a Christian, all of us are in the Beloved. We're in Jesus. Indeed, we're in the Beloved. Now we are called Beloved by God. Romans 1, 7. So we have this blessing of redemption in the Son, and I broke it up into three bullet points. I know I'm getting crazy with the outline here. Three bullet points. And the first one is redemption. Redemption. 
Verse 7a says, In Him we have redemption through His blood. And I'll just tell you, we're not going to make it much further past this word today. No, I'm just joking. But no, that's partially true. Redemption is a term that we just read it and we go on. It's one of those T-I-O-N words and we just go on. Justification, sanctification, redemption. We just go past it and it's unassuming and it's not really that big a deal. But you have to understand, redemption is huge. Redemption is costly. Redemption is, is something that commands a great, heavy price. A huge price. And I want to make myself as starkly clear as possible, so we need to go back to the beginning. Would you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 2? Let's get back to the beginning of the Word of God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And keep your Bibles open there because we're going to walk through and I'm going to skip down and walk you through something so that you understand this word, this term redemption. And I think it will be eye-opening for some of you. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, quote, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But, verse 17, From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent, that's the devil, that's the snake in the grass, was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it or touch it. She added something to it herself. Or you will die. Verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. See, there it is. You can be your own God. Knowing good and evil. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was delightful for the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise or make her like God, in other words, she took from it, she took the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Go to verse 9. Then the Lord God called to the man. Go to verse 11. Halfway through, 11b says, God asked him a question. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Verse 13 of chapter 3. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate it. The devil made me do it. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you will go and the dust will You will eat all the days of your life. Go to verse 17 of chapter 3. Then to Adam he said, God speaking, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it in all the days of your life. So when you have your garden and there's weeds in it, just blame Adam. Here it is. Verse 18, but thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field, but by the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because you are from it, and you are taken from the dust, and to the dust you shall return. So why am I reading all that? I want you to understand, that is the fall of mankind. That is the fall of Adam and Eve, and sin and death entered the human race. In Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as one man, that's Adam, sin entered in the world, death through sin, then death spread to all mankind, because all sin, thank you, Adam. And I tell a lot of people, you want free will, the only person that had true free will was Adam, and look what he did. Romans 6.23 tells us, because of that sin that we were imputed with by Adam, something we get in return for it. And Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is what? Death. So spiritual death is the paycheck 
For slavery to sin. That's your paycheck. Thank you very much. Death. So you're born into sin. You continue to sin your whole life. And you receive the due penalty. Spiritual death. That's eternity in hell. The wages of sin is death. Separation from life, which is God. So why am I telling you all this? Because Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3 shows us the fall. And the fall equals death. And that is an insurmountable problem when you're born because you're born dead. I've read the Old Testament. Maybe you've done this before. You've read the Old Testament. You said, why is there so much killing in the Old Testament? Why is there so much killing? Death, death, sacrifice, bleeding animals out over and over and over. Think about the temple. Think about the tabernacle in the desert before the temple. So much animals killed over and over and over. Why? To cover the sins of the people. To, to, to temporarily put a band-aid over them. Not fix them, but to, to just let God bypass them. And you read about all the death, all the sacrificial death, all the bloodletting. And so much so, it's almost sickening to think about But it's only a temporary healing. It's only a small fix. It doesn't solve the problem. Because sin equals death. Sin equals death. And God might pass you over for a little while. Just like Adam. If you touch that tree or eat of it, you're going to die. Did he poof die? No, he still lived, but he died. Sin equals death. And I ask myself when I read the Old Testament, why is there so much shedding of innocent blood? And the answer is, blood is life. The the old word actually was lifeblood, actually. We shortened it. Genesis chapter 9, you can turn with me there. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. I want you to see this because this is paramount to understanding this term redemption. Genesis chapter 9 verse 3 says this. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. So vegetarians, there's a good verse for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. There's a vegetarians, that's for you. Verse 4. Only you should not eat flesh with its life. Wait a minute, flesh is life. No, flesh with its life. That is its blood. It says that. It's blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. Every beast I will require it. And every man from every man's brother I will require the life of man. The lifeblood of man. So sin equals death in the garden. And life equals blood. So that's why so much blood was sacrificed in the Old Testament. Because the sins that brought death were of the people. And blood was covering those sins. Life was covering death over and over and over, but temporary. The fall brings death, and blood sacrifices brought temporary life for just a little bit. However, in this passage, and what we're reading right here in verse 7a says, in Ephesians 1, In Him, Jesus Christ, we Christians have redemption through His blood. Jesus is lifeblood. That word redemption is a payment. Jesus paid your payment, your debt sin, with his own lifeblood to cover your death. Life covers death. Yet not in a temporary way as the Old Testament. Not like lambs, not like goats and bulls and pigeon doves and Hebrews 10.4 says it is impossible for the blood of bulls. It's impossible for the blood of goats to take away your sins. It doesn't do that. It doesn't take your sins away. Verse 10 of chapter 10 of Hebrews says, By this will we have been sanctified, not through all those bulls and goats, but through the offering of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So the cost of redemption is someone's blood that is capable to cover that debt. And no one's blood was able to cover that debt except Jesus' blood. And the word for redemption is another thing that you have to understand. This is a Roman term. And in the time of Rome, there were slave markets. And you would buy slaves just like you would go to the grocery store to buy something. And when you went to buy a slave, if you were to want to free a slave... 
you would pay a redemption price for that slave. And you could set him free. And guess what the price was? 30 pieces of silver. The same thing Judas got to betray Jesus for. You purchased someone's life off the slave block, and that was redeeming them. We think of redeeming a gift certificate or something like that. This is so much greater than that. That person's life was dead. And he gave his life to cover their death and give them a life again. And that's exactly what happens to all of us. Jesus paid the price to buy you off the slave market of sin. Thank you for joining us today for Unleashing the Truth, the broadcast ministry of Christ Church of the Valley in Vacaville. You can hear Unleashing the Truth each Sunday at 9.30 a.m., If you're in the Vacaville area, you can visit Christ Church of the Valley and hear Pastor John Jordan live. Find out more at ChristCV.org. We hope you join us next week for Unleashing the Truth.